Hi, everyone. We're going to talk about the two gods of the Bible today. And boy, it should be fun. It should be a good one for you. I really do hope that you can see um, how there are definitely two gods in the Bible. There are two gods in the Bible. Let me give it to you first straight um, who these gods are. Okay. There's one God that is all light and all love, right? This is what the New Testament tells us about God. God is all light. God is all love. God is all light. There is no shadow of turning in him. No, not even one hint of shade in the God of light, in the God of love. Okay. That's one God. There is another God in the Bible, and he is the God of good and evil. And this is what makes him so deceptive, so crafty, and so subtle. He's so subtle. Guys, do you understand what it's subtle means? Like you can hardly tell them apart, the two gods, because the crafty, deceptive one sprinkles all of his stuff with goodness, with grace, with light. He mimics the all light, the all loving God. This is his trick. This is his trick. So you don't even know that there are two gods in the Bible. Okay. You understand there's a serpent in the garden, right? Guys, something that we need to understand is that when Adam eats of the serpent's fruit, he gets kicked out of the garden and falls to earth and the earth is cursed. The curse of Adam is that he will wander around on earth and it's only going to produce thorns and thistles. What a stark contrast to the garden that he just fell from. Adam's curse is to labor and toil and by the sweat of his face will he eat bread and the ground will only produce thorns and thistles. From garden to literal desert, okay? From abundance and greenery to thorns and thistles and lack of everything. Okay, so we think at that point, when Adam falls out of the garden, we think that the serpent disappears from the story. But wait a minute. You have just eaten a poison apple. Where is God? God, true God, the God of love, the God of light, remains in the garden. Adam falls to earth, and there's somebody else taking dominion over Adam and the earth, making it thorns, thistles, dry, desert, empty land. Okay? So... We have the story of Abraham come through and we have everything that happens in Genesis and then we get to the Exodus. Well, it can be proven from Exodus on the whole story of the Bible, okay? So we're going to go to Moses who leads them out of Egypt, Okay, Egypt at that time, you guys, it though they were slaves in Egypt, the Israelites, uh, they were, I should call them the Hebrews, they were, um, it, it wasn't a desert like it is today. They, they were at the Nile River, basically, you know, near the Red Sea. Okay, it was a v- very fertile crescent of the world at this time. Okay, so Moses comes along. And Moses is supposed to be a representation of God. So he should be all light and all love. Okay? What 
we see with Moses, when he comes down from the mountain, everybody knows this story about the Ten Commandments. He comes down from Mount Sinai, Sinai, and he's got the tablets in his hand. What happens to him three times, you can see that his face shone. He was glowing. Maybe this is the light of God Re- revealed in Moses' face. I think the traditional story on TV shows him with white hair coming out now, okay? Because Moses' face shone after he came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, speaking to God. God's backside, by the way, which is important. Moses' face shone. 7160, right here. You can see it three times. Let's go look and see what his face shone means. Well, to shine. Well, maybe he's reflecting the light of the true God. Maybe he's reflecting the light of the true God until we get further down and we see that this word also means to display horns, to be horned. What the heck would Moses be doing with horns on his head like a devil instead of like a good angel? Okay, well, this isn't enough to um, convince us of anything. To push or gore with horns right? To push or gore with horns. To shoot out horns? To push with the horn. What are we talking about here, Moses? Okay, it must just mean to shine. He's reflecting the light of the true God, right? Or is there some deception, some subtle deception at work here? You know, Lucifer, you know what his name means. He is the light bearer. Maybe Moses went to see Lucifer. We, we, you have to have an analyzing mind in order to figure out the Bible. So let's see if we can prove it somewhere else. What happened to Moses? Is he on the light side or is he on the dark side? Is he subtle? Is he displaying horns or is he displaying light? And is this light the true light of Jesus Christ and his God? Or is it maybe the light of Lucifer and his God, the horned God? Well, here we go. Moses is before the burning bush. And Moses answered the Lord and said, Behold, they will not believe that you have sent me to these people in Egypt, right? And the Lord has not appeared unto you, the Hebrews who he goes to save out of Egypt, will say to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, what is in your hand? And Moses said, well, it's a rod. It's my staff. It's my walking stick. And God said, cast it on the ground, Moses. So Moses cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said to Moses, put forth your hand and take it by the tail. Take the serpent by its tail. Moses put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. He now has a walking stick. You know it. You've seen it in the Ten Commandments movie. That's a serpent transformed stick and serpent. Then we have to question again. Wait a minute, what is the serpent doing in here? And why did Moses grow horns here? Is he of the true light? Or if he is he of the false light? That subtle serpent. The God of maybe of good and evil. Maybe there's some evil mixed in our Old Testament. Let's go see, okay? Well, Moses proceeds to Egypt. And he brings on the plagues from hell to the Egyptians, turns the water, the Nile into blood for three days, sends a plague of frogs, sends all kinds of death and destruction on Egypt. Does this sound like the God of all light who has no shadow of turning? The God of all love, unconditional love. So Moses They are preparing for the Passover, the first Passover ever. And the Lord says to the people, they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts. You know how they protect themselves in the Passover. 
right? They sprinkled lamb's blood over the door frame because the last plague of Egypt was that all the firstborn sons were going to die by God's hand and Moses was going to help this along. Okay, take the blood, strike it on the two side posts and the upper door post of the houses and they shall eat flesh and let nothing remain until the morning, that which remains to the morning. Okay, so why are they doing this? They are doing this because God is going to send a destroyer, he calls them. God is going to send the destroyer to kill the firstborn. Okay. Let me find it this way for you. I should have reviewed this before getting it for you. Here we go. Okay, God is going to send the destroyer. Here we go. Now, he just set up here that he is going to, right here, the Lord's Passover, right? He's going to kill the firstborn. For I, this is the Lord God, Moses' Jehovah, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. The Lord is speaking. And smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment I am the Lord. Okay, then here we go. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. But you, Hebrews, if you put the blood on your doors, I will know when he sees the blood. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when the Lord sees the blood upon the lintel and upon the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. To smite you. Who's going to smite? I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and I will smite all the firstborn. Who's the destroyer? Apparently, it's the Lord. He just called himself the destroyer. And then, of course, if we want to know who the destroyer is, we can go to the book of Revelation and we're going to find, again, I spell it incorrectly. We are going to find out who the destroyer is. Revelation 9, 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. What does Apollyon mean? The destroyer the angel of the bottomless pit, the destroyer. Exactly what the Lord, Moses' God, called himself in Exodus 12. I will not suffer the destroyer to come in and smite you, but I, the Lord, am going to come in and smite you. The destroyer and I are the same person. So we have to think twice about this subtle serpent who seems to disappear after the Garden of Eden incident. Now, if Jesus Christ was to be tempted in the devil, in the desert by the devil for 40 days, 40 days Jesus is tempted by the devil in the desert. You all know the story. 
Once he's baptized, he goes into the desert for 40 days and is tempted of the devil. Do you think that might mimic the story in the Old Testament where the Israelites go into the desert for 40 years to be tempted of the devil? 40 days in the desert to be tempted of the devil? 40 years in the desert probably to be tempted of the devil. You see, in the desert, there are thorns and thistles. There is no garden there. Who rules the place of the curse? Adam's curse. The serpent rules it. Adam was cursed to strive and toil, and the ground would only produce thorns and thistles like a dry desert wasteland. Who, who's ruling? Who's there? Well, we could probably call him the Lord of hosts, which is his favorite name to call himself in the Old Testament. He calls himself the Lord of hosts. <laughs> Shiloh is another giveaway, but that's for another video. Shiloh is another giveaway. Okay. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts, which of course is the Lord Jehovah, who is called the Lord of hosts repeatedly in the Bible. Okay. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the, 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 I can't speak, Lord of hosts. Here we go. Who is this Lord? He is the God of war. Army, war, warfare. Army, host. The God of war? Does that seem like the same God that the Prince of Peace would worship? Hmm. The God of war, is that light? Is that love? He is this God, the God of, uh, the Lord of hosts is the God of good and evil. There's times where he's merciful in the Old Testament and pretends to be this holy, righteous God, of course. Then there are times when he is utterly despicable, such as Jeremiah 13, 14. And I will dash them one against another. Even the fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord, I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, but destroy them. There are two gods in the Bible. The one in the Old Testament is masquerading as the God of light, but he is the God of light and darkness. He is the God of serpents and dragons. And even David is confused by him. So here we go. Psalm 18. David is making a psalm to the Lord, which he did all the time. And he says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So I shall be saved from my enemies. Wait a minute. What enemies, David? Jesus said, love your enemies, bless those that curse you. You will have no enemies if you truly love your enemies, right? But didn't Jehovah tell Joshua to go out and kill all the other people in the promised land, go out and kill every nation. But wait a minute, Lord of hosts, you just told us do not kill in your 10 commandments. And now you're ordering death and destruction everywhere. War everywhere. Because you're the Lord of hosts, the Lord of war, the Lord of armies, the Lord of warfare, where Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Put down your sword, turn the other cheek, love your enemies, and bless them 
that curse you. Two different gods. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth, wrathful, angry, vengeful. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Smoky nostrils, fire out of his mouth. He's a dragon. Coals were kindled by it. Sounds a little bit more like hell than it does heaven. Coals. He bowed the heavens also and came, came down. And darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub. What kind of cherub? <laughs> Not a cute little angelic one. And did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. This is the dragon, the serpent with wings. He's hiding in darkness because he's subtle. He's crafty. He's deceptive. He masquerades as God and the people believe him. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. Darkness I thought God was all light, and there is not even a shade of turning in him, according to the New Testament. What are these dark waters and thick clouds? And the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed. There was brightness before him, his thick clouds passed over that brightness, apparently making them dim. Hailstones came after he darkened the clouds, and coals of fire, again, representing hell. Storms, hell, fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Great. What a loving God. He sent out his arrows, because he's the God of war. Okay, so there's something about the God of the Old Testament that's a little off kilter. He's a little wicked. He demands death. He says, dash the infants against the stones. He loves all this blood and gore. Okay, now, with the pure, there's a God who will show himself pure. But with the froward, you will show yourself froward. It's in the same psalm I just read to you about the dragon, the Lord in his darkness and coals and arrows. Here we go. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With an upright man, you will show yourself upright. That's the God of good. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. That's the God of good. With the froward, you will show yourself Froward? God is froward, which means perverted. God is going to show himself as perverse. This is the God of good, but he's also the God of pervertedness. Evil. Twisted, distorted, crooked, perverse, perverted. He will show himself froward because he's the God of good and he's the God of evil. He can do both. He's deceptive. He's subtle. He's twisted. He's perverted. He's crooked. He tells you do not kill. And then he tells you go to war. He tries to be merciful and then he swallows you up in an earthquake. He says that he loves his people and then he gives you bitter waters, which means poisoned waters. There are two gods in the Bible, and you think it's one God. Jesus Christ had a completely different God, which is why he calls him Father, and the word Jehovah never shows up once in the New Testament. 
Okay? Because the God of Moses, Jehovah, the horned, serpent-carrying, plague-bringing destroyer, is not Jesus' father. The God of hosts is not the Prince of Peace's father. Two totally different gods. The God of law is not Jesus' father. The God of law is not Jesus' father. And this is why Jesus Christ came to end the law. Two gods, and boy, does that serpent have all of Christianity deceived. Nobody truly has faith in Jesus. They don't know that the God of the Old Testament is not his father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, my ass. Okay, it is not what they think it is. There is a God that is much higher than the God of the Bible. He's the true God. He's the Father of Jesus. He's Abba. He's not the destroyer. He's the creator. And he will never, ever, ever order anyone to kill, harm. He will never kick anyone out of his garden. Okay, that's it. I hope that helps. I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.